Um, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure um, to talk here today. And I would like to talk about the clinical and technical assessment of the tinnitus patient with a special focus on uh, or, or of the otolaryngologist. So I myself are um, otolaryngology. And um, so this is the focus I would like to uh, present today. This will be quite a practical and yeah, technical thing. And I'm not sure of our audience, but I think I hope everybody has something to find in it and some new aspects um, to learn. So um, the perspective of the otolaryngologist is probably pretty important because often he's the first point of contact and therefore plays an important role. That means that every otolaryngologist, at least that is my opinion, should acquire at least basic understanding of the tinnitus pathophysiology because if we look in the general otology practice, I would say that in between 10 to 15 or even 20% of patients will show up uh, with the a symptom of tinnitus. And I would like to very much emphasize on the importance of the really first contact. A lot of things can be done in a good way at that time point. However, wrong words in that situation can also lead into a completely wrong situation and create some strong tinnitus careers of the infect affected uh, individual. So it is very important to differentiate in between acute and chronic tinnitus and to develop core competences in the detection of um, differentiating in between subjective and objective tinnitus. At the end, um, the most important thing for the otolaryngologist is to detect underlying otological and somatic diseases, because if you treat these um, parts of the problem, then sometimes, and it is not quite frequent the case, but it helps the patient very much, you can cure tinnitus on that way. The starting point, of course, is always the history. We talk about um, the time situation. How long does the individual have tinnitus? Are there any special circumstances of the onset of tinnitus? We ask them, is your tinnitus constant or is it pulsatile? And if it is pulsatile, then we differentiate in between the pulse synchronous tinnitus, which is completely synchronous um, to, to the pulse. And um, if not, it's, if it's just a clicking sound, which is arrhythmic, then it gives us some hints to other um, um, underlying problems. We also ask about vertigo. Is there vertigo associated with the tinnitus and other otological symptoms like ear pain, oral fullness, odoria, hearing loss, if there was previous ear surgery, if there are any sinonasal problems. So these are all things which, which might be interesting. And as you know, there is a, a part of tinnitus complaints, which we also call somatosensory tinnitus. We also ask the patient if there is any possibility to modulate the tinnitus by doing somatic maneuvers, um, clenching the teeth and moving the neck in a certain position. Does it um, make the tinnitus louder or more silent, or is it changing the frequency and so on and so forth? And even as an otolaryngologist, I think uh, you should ask the patient for the psychosocial background, ask about stress, empathize with the patient, and of course, um, avoid catastrophic statements. As an addition, we also start, um, even in the first contact with the patient, um, to do some questionnaires. And, and there are different opportunities, different possibilities, what you can use um, in order to assess the degree of suffering. Um, here is, for example, the tinnitus functional index, abbreviated TFI, which is more sensitive to detect treatment-related changes and the tinnitus handicap inventory is probably at this moment still the internationally most widely accepted ones. It exists or is validated in the most frequent languages. And at the end, you receive a score, which can be graded into um, a certain handicap. You see here in between zero and 100 points. And then you have an additional um, impression of the degree of suffering in addition to your history, which you took. And, and usually I think um, these are pretty much the same at the end, but uh, sometimes I think a number in terms of a, of a score is helpful, especially when you follow up the patient um, and see him for several times doing some therapeutic interventions in between, then you have an other way of measuring. Of course, we need also to be very clear that this is a completely subjective way of measuring um, the um, amount of, of um, yeah, suffering. 
Um, we usually consider um, grade one to three as compensated situation, whereas grade five and four indicate the decompensated um, problem. If you want to keep it easy, here's a flowchart where you can easily differentiate in between compensated and decompensated only with a, with a, with a small or some questions uh, to the patient if you uh, want to avoid these questionnaires, then this is of course possible as well. And you see here, um, grade one, no impairment, completely um, compensated if there's no annoyance. If it's sometimes annoying and only a slight impairment then you have grade two. And, and then if you ask questions like, um, are you able to work? Can you sleep? Can, can you do your housework? Um, can you concentrate at all? And, and he says, yes, for sometimes, then it might be grade three. And if everything is disturbed by the tinnitus, then we have a grade four. So this is another very easy way of, of estimating the degree of suffering. And if all that is done, then the next step um, in the flowchart of the otolaryngologist, of course, is the clinical examination. Ideally, um, you use the microscope. You can see here a classical otomicroscope for inspection of the external auditory canal and the tympanic membrane. Usually, you, you find in a tinnitus patient this situation here. The, the, the picture in the middle is a completely normal ear canal, a uh, nice tympanic membrane. Um, you can see the ossicles shining through the membrane. You see this light reflex, everything is fine. Sometimes you're lucky, and, and especially in an acute tinnitus patient, somebody says, okay, after taking a shower two days ago, I, I, the hearing was bad, and then there was a, a roaring sound in, in my ear, and, and then you can see here a wax occlusion of the external ear canal. That This is the perfect situation, of course, <laughs> because then you take it out, and, and usually the hearing is fine after that, and um, the tinnitus is gone, but this only, to be honest, happens very seldomly. Sometimes um, you find surprises if you look inside um, the ear canal, which you could not estimate from, from the history. Um, this is a picture on the upper left here of a cholesteatoma. Um, this is a picture on the upper right here of a um, exostosis situation in the external ear canal. You can see that you barely don't see the tympanic membrane shining through, only this small part here, and the, the rest is occluded of the ear canal by, by these bony exostoses. Here you can see a big hole in the membrane. You can see in the middle of the middle ear cavity, you can see here the malleus, you can see the incus and the stapes. This is a big eardrum perforation, um, uh, which happens after chronic otitis media or as a sign of chronic otitis media. Here is a traumatic picture on the, on, on the left lower side where you can see blood on the membrane and inside, in, inside the tympanum probably. But if that happens, then you usually have a special history about what's going on before. Um, as I said before, we need to differentiate it um, objective from subjective forms of tinnitus. And objective tinnitus, of course, is very rare. You have it only in probably minor than 1% of all tinnitus job subjects, but it's important because sometimes it can completely be cured. And, and that is what I mentioned before, one of the main tasks of the audiologist to, to find out what's going on there. And, if somebody is reporting a sound which feels like hearing his whistles in his ears, then I think um, you should um, pay special attention. Maybe you can use um, auscultation to hear something around the ear. You can use the ultrasound um, because if you um, um, occlude the, for example, the internal jugular vein when the patient is lying down and, and then he says, okay, now the sound disappeared and you can be pretty much convinced that this might be um, a whistle sound which comes from, from the veins and, and this might be a clear hint um, for further investigations. Um, here are some pathologies. You can see here a glomus jugulary tumor. Um, the next one here is an apparent internal carotid artery. Sometimes you can even see it um, with otomicroscopy. I will show you a case later on. Um, and the last example, a smaller glomus tumor here, which is just um, located in the tympanon. These uh, are things which, of course, then should be investigated further. And then this is a clear in indication to do um, imaging in terms of magnetic resonance imaging, um, MRI angiography, and even invasive angiography. Um, but this should only be done when you can also cure the problem in the same situation. Here's one case study, the first one, it's a 64 year old female, which came to my clinic a few years ago. She reported about pulsing crones ringing in the right ear for one year now. Hearing was fine. 
um, um, there was some pain and pressure, pressure sensation around the ear in the right temporal area. And she has hypertension, which was treated. And physical activity leads to an increase of the ringing in her ear. So the, the pulsating increased with the pulse. And of course, as I said before, I had a first look inside the ear with the odor microscopy. And if you focus on that area here, then you can see, um, I'm sorry for my moving of the camera here, but if you look at that area here, then, then you can see a pulse synchronous movement of that part of the membrane. And that's, this led us to do imaging studies like here, the MRI, and then we saw the problem here, um, a classical picture of a glomus jugulary tumor, which could also be confirmed um, by the CT scan. And you can see it. this is the tympanic cavity, and this is the part which is reaching out to the tympanic membrane. And this was the part which we could um, see moving when we looked inside the ear canal. Um, we treated her by, by a surgery of this tumor. And after tumor, um, the um, tinnitus was gone completely away. But unfortunately, due to the localization, of course, the hearing was, was uh, gone as well. Another um, thing is, for example, as you can see here, arteriovenous fistulas. This can often be palpated. If you palpate around the ear, like in that area here, and it can also be auscultated on the skull, usually behind the ear, and the treatment can really be provided by an endovascular intervention of a neuroradiologist. So this is um, the situation where we go inside the vessels, um, display um, the fistula, and then occlude the fistula by some material, which brings the neuroradiologist inside of the vessels. He's occluding the fistula, and after that, the tinnitus is gone. Really impressive. So for a short... Um, summary of the objective tinnitus situation of vascular origin. Um, you should collaborate with an interventional neuroradiologist in order to stand these things to coil or clue them. Um, if you have the impression that it comes from carotid stenosis or carotid dissection, probably the vascular surgeon would be the correct partner. And if it's uh, like a glomus tumor, which I showed you before, um, aneurysms and things like that, I think this is the place for auto neuro neurosurgery. And in all these situations, you can really um, cure the tinnitus completely. So these um, situations should be detected. Another way of experiencing um, objective tinnitus is a myoclonus. So involuntary um, movement of muscles around the ear, especially of the palate and inside the middle ear. We have very tiny muscles like the tensor tympani muscle here and the, the uh, stapedius muscle uh, right here from the stapes um, um, inserting right here in between the, the head of the stapes and, and the um, incus. And this can something uh, which can be heard by others. And if you are very silent and listen to the clicking now, I hope you can hear it. This is just recorded with an iPhone in front of the ear of a patient. And if you then do a tympanogram, you can even um, objectivize this tinnitus by movements which can be demonstrated here of the tympanic membrane, which is a reason for that clicking sound. Um, here is a picture of the palate. If you look inside, then you can see here the movement of the palate, which is completely involuntary. The patient doesn't do anything. And this is the reason for hearing these clicks in his ears. Here is the second case of a 33-year-old male patient who has clicking in his right ears for three years now, um, normal hearing otherwise, which is demonstrated here. And he reported an increase of loudness with the change of weather. And again, we could objective uh, or find objective measurements in order to, to see what's going on with this tympanic membrane. And in this case, then we use the flexible transnasal endoscope and we could observe movements in the palate if we look on the backside. And these movements are then um, transmitted via the eustachian tube, which would just go from here to the ear. This is the right side, and here's the right ear. And this is the reason for experiencing these clicking sounds, because the sound is, is transmitted um, from the nasopharynx um, to the middle ear. And this is a classical reason for using Botox applied to the soft palate, and then usually you can um, find after a week that these movements stop and the tinnitus stop as well. And after three or four months, when the Botox disappeared, you can repeat um, that thing. This is something which I just saw last week, and I would really like to show it to you because this is a very interesting case of a 35-year-old gentleman 
who experienced a strange roaring in his right ear. Always when he was tapping uh, with one of the fingers on the nail of the other ones. And if you now focus just on this area here, then you can see very clearly that this area is moving. I think I go back once again and now just focus on that area here. And you can see now you're an inward movement of the tympanic membrane. It moves to the inside. Always when he was doing this uh, maneuver with his, um, with his hands, and he could also do it with his foot nails and with his knees. So the respective manipulations led to a contraction of the tensor tympani muscle. The patient was fine with just the explanation and was happy that he knows, okay, he's not crazy. Um, we can see what he's hearing and that, that's what is. He, he didn't want to have any further therapy on that. I think we can skip that because I heard that there's a, another complete talk on somatic tinnitus. By the way, also an otolaryngologist can do these movements, maneuvers in order to differentiate in between uh, different types of somatosensory tinnitus is very helpful. At the end, I would like to show you some audiological measurements which we are doing. Um, um, we do in every patient a putone audiometry up to 8K. And then we differentiate from the age. In the youngers, we measure up to 12 or even 16K. And for the oldest, we do speech audiometry in order to get an impression how big is the amount of hearing loss. Um, pitch and loudness, uh, loudness matching is more academic and, and in order to have some, some reasons for counseling the patient and tell him, okay, um, this makes sense because usually uh, the highest amount of hearing loss corresponds very well with the pitch of the, of the tinnitus when you do a, um, specific measurements. So this is helpful for counseling the patients. At the end, of course, the audiologic assessment is a reason to go for further um, sound therapy, like hearing aids, cochlear implants, and so on and so forth. We will talk on that in other sessions of the TRI Academy. And in case of asymmetric hearing loss with tinnitus on the worst side, this is a clear reason for doing MRI scans in order to exclude uh, retrocochlear lesions. Um, the ultra high frequency audiometry is interesting because um, if you have a younger patient and, and he says, okay, my hearing is anyway fine, but I have a very high pitch tinnitus, then you measure the standard audiogram. And if you go in the upper really ultra high frequencies, then you can see here, okay, it goes down, 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 down in that way. And usually in that area at the end, there you find the tinnitus. So um, I think that's it from my side. I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, Important is that a comprehensive history is followed by an ENT examinations, in some case, imaging studies. Um, and for all the patients we see, we perform um, adapted audiological measurements. And at the end, it's very important to detect the objective reasons for tinnitus, because sometimes here in that situation, you can find a cure. Thank you very much for your attention.